I believe that the Bible is believable and a belief in the Bible is compatible with the belief in science. The Bible isn't a scientific textbook. Science tries to explain how things happen using naturalistic phenomena. But the Bible explains why things happen. That God has a plan and a purpose with the world. Now, there are wonderful things which are uh, seen in nature which speak about um, the divine handiwork of God. Now, as a trained scientist, um, I'm a molecular biologist and I deal with genes and proteins, the things which are the very small structures inside cells. And one such protein is, is, for example, ATP synthase. And it's a wonderfully but incredibly complicated protein. It's, it has a wonderful design which is just like an electric motor. It has a rotor, it has things like brushes which make it ro rotate round. And it has, if you like, a power source that causes it to rotate round. Now this is a very important enzyme for our bodies because ATP is the currency of, if you like, energy. What that means is, is that how we spend money um, as a, you know, in terms of our currency with pound, coins and, and banknotes, well the, the cells use energy currency called ATP and it's so important that we, we make our own body's weight in ATP every day. Now for them to actually work, they, um, they work by sitting inside this membranous bag which has to be completely intact. A membrane is made out of lipid and proteins. And so it works because there is an electrical gradient between the inside and the outside. And that electrical gradient powers the rotation of the ATP. Now, for that um, electrical gradient to be present, obviously the, the bag has to be intact. But there also has to be another set of enzymes and proteins all working perfectly together to make that electrical gradient. So. It seems very difficult, you've got these four things that are absolutely required, how they were all evolved by step-by-step -step changes. It looks like, and it certainly works as if, it was being completely designed. And to me, it speaks of a wonderful, intelligent design of, well, by God, the Divine Creator. Now, the second... Um, example of wonderful design that I've that I've come across is this example of the bones that go into the woodpecker's beak. Now woodpeckers as we know are wonderful creatures are able to make holes with their beak and actually find grubs inside trees but the woodpeckers have these wonderful bones called the hyoid bones which actually get, which are attached here at uh, the beak extend all the way around the back of the head with some unique and exquisite joints at the back which allow the bones then to bend and to come underneath the jaw and into the tongue of the woodpecker. And so when the bones and the muscles um, contract, the bones are forced, because of these wonderful hinges at the back, into the tongue, and the tongue extends, and so it can reach out and stiffen the tongue and grab that elusive grub. Um, but the fact is that the woodpecker has also got these wonderful barbs on the end of the tongue so that once it actually reaches the, the grub it can grip it and pull it back into it into the mouth now these uh, wonderful bones just to me speak of a wonderful design that uh, a, di a divine designer has been at work to create those wonderful structures to allow that woodpecker to do what it does and that's get grubs and, and live off them the Apostle Paul spoke about the things of God, his eternal power, his um, divine Godhead being clearly seen and understood by the things which, which are revealed to us in the natural creation. And so that we have no excuse, we can see that God is at work and he's properly at work because of creation and the fact that he has a divine plan and purpose which is centred on that creation. I actually believe the Bible for many reasons, but for me, one of the crucial issues is the actual manuscript availability that we find within the sources. 
My understanding is that a historical source is only as good as the documents that it sits upon. And the evidence for the New Testament documents is extremely strong, particularly when you compare the source material for the secular sources of the time. Two of the earliest biographies of Alexander the Great, for example, are written uh, 400 years or so after his death by Arian and by Plutarch, uh, are considered by historians to be the strongest evidence for his life. And yet we're still finding them four or 500 years after he died in 323 BC. And yet, for me, the remarkable thing is that historians are still prepared to treat this as a key source document. And the same is true for some of the lateness of the manuscripts. If you take, for example, the, the Annals of Tacitus, written maybe 100 or 110 AD, the earliest available manuscript for him is not found until 850 AD. It's the same for the letters of Pliny. It's the same for the lives of Suetonius. The Bible manuscript evidence is much more compelling than some of the secular sources. If you take the earliest surviving codices of the New Testament, Codex Vaticanus and Codex Sinaiticus, they both date from around about the middle of the 4th century AD. Now that immediately closes the window on the sources to a much shorter period than, for example, the Annals of Tacitus or the works of Pliny. And we can even push it further than that. If you take the earliest surviving manuscript fragment, which is one of the Ryland's papyri held in the John Ryland's Library in Manchester, uh, we actually find that there's an early fragment of the Gospel of John. It contains just a few verses from John chapter 18. Uh, and it was found in Egypt, and historians have dated it to around about 125 or 130 AD. Now, even the most liberal scholars will tell you that John, the Gospel writer, John the Apostle, died in the AD 90s, or perhaps as late as AD 100. So when you consider that this Gospel fragment of his is available 25 or 30 years after that, we get this remarkable piece of evidence that the scribe who was perhaps recording the fragment that we have was alive at the time that John the writer himself was alive. In other words, what the document does is take us right to the very heartbeat of the gospel message and it gives us something really significant to work with. Now you can add to this the number of manuscript copies which are still available. There are eight copies, for example, for Herodotus, one of the so-called fathers of history. There's seven copies of some of Aristotle's work. There's 20 copies left of Tacitus. And yet there's somewhere between 20,000 and 24,000 New Testament documents or New Testament fragments surviving. I suppose really the bottom line is this. The biographer of Jesus who takes a look at the gospel records as recorded in the New Testament is on much safer ground and much surer ground than the biographer of, for example, Julius Caesar or Alexander the Great or Pliny the Younger. And I don't hear anybody arguing the evidence for their existence at any point in time. For me, the New Testament manuscript evidence is compelling enough. But if you add to that the most remarkable archaeological discovery of the 20th century, it seems that both the Old Testament and the New Testament documents stand up to scrutiny. Back in 1947, uh, an Arab goat herder near Qumran, around the area of the Dead Sea, threw a stone into a cave, and he heard a strange noise. So he went to investigate and found in the cave and in caves nearby a variety of clay jars and in the jars were leather documents. Uh, and what he didn't realise at the time, but what archaeologists and historians have later discovered, is that he had found what's become known as the Dead Sea Scrolls, the most incredible manuscript discovery of the 20th century. The Dead Sea Scrolls have been dated to around about 100 BC. They're the most convincing and most complete record that we have of both Old Testament and New Testament manuscripts. It seems that there were some monastic farmers living around the area in the first century AD, and when the Romans took Jerusalem in AD 70, they tried to hide their manuscripts and hide their documents in these jars in the caves. One of the scrolls contains all 66 chapters of the book of Isaiah, and it's remarkable because it also antedates the previous oldest copy of the book of Isaiah by nearly a 1,000 years. The Masoretic text was around 900 or 1,000 AD, this Dead Sea Scrolls copy is from around 100 BC. Normally you'd expect remarkable changes in a document over a thousand years. That's a pretty long period of time. And yet what's remarkable for scholars of the Dead Sea Scrolls is that that copy of Isaiah found in the caves in Qumran is virtually identical to the later Masoretic copy that dates from 900 or 1000 AD. You would expect to find many more changes than you do and even the changes and the variations which are there are pretty negligible. They certainly don't impact on anything central to the Gospel or central to, the, to Isaiah's message. I spent a lot of time working with old manuscripts and working with old books, and it seems to me that the Bible more than passes the tests that historians lay down when they work with ancient source material. 
And I find that that means that when I come to the Bible or when anyone else comes to the Bible, they can treat it not merely as a book of old documents, a book of old manuscripts, but as something living and powerful containing a message for us today. so many reasons why I believe in the Bible and one of them is the fact that I'm a gardener so I'm working with nature with plants all the time let me give you an example there is a quote in the Bible that said that God made herbs or vegetation plants for the service of man and I find that extraordinary the first thing is that you might read it and think well it's a bit of a throwaway line apart from the fact that there are no throwaway lines when it comes to God speaking. Plants are providing so many things for us without us really realising. Take, for example, the car tyres. They're made from rubber. What is rubber? It's the processed sap of a tree. Our medicines as well, things like aspirin or uh, digitalis, so many plants are provided for us. You know, when you eat carrots, then within carrots there is vitamin A, and vitamin A does help our eyesight. People say that you should eat your greens because it will make you more healthy. And again, what is coming from the earth and is being manufactured by plants is actually beneficial for us. And to me, that just speaks of the whole system being interdependent, interrelated, and designed. And whenever I eat something, whether it be chocolate or whatever it is, whether I get dressed and put my cotton clothes on, which are plant-based material, or eat my bread, which is plant-based material, I think of this verse where God made this whole system to be interrelated and made plants for the service of man. Now, another thing that you can do in the world of plants, in the world of nature, is to look at the plants around you and all the TV programmes that speak of evolution, I love it actually when the presenters occasionally mention the word design. And lo and behold, you can't have design without a designer. And this one plant I'd just like to t tell you about is known as the Venus flytrap. It comes from temperate zones of the world, from North America. And it's remarkable in that at the end of the leaves there are traps. Now, it lives in boggy ground and the nutrients that it needs it can't get from the soil. So it has an active trap to trap flying insects. But when you start to analyse the trap, it is extraordinary. It's part of the leaf, and yet it can move. And the two sides of the trap actually produce nectar to attract insects. It also develops, in the presence of sunlight, a reddish coloration. Again, insects, flies, attracted to rotting meat. And when they land on it, there are, on each of the two sides of the trap, three generally little hairs. Sometimes there's two, sometimes one, but normally there's three. Now, what the insect has to do is to touch two of those hairs within 20 seconds. So if it does that, then the trap springs shut. Now, to make sure that the insect is of a decent size, you will see on the edge of the traps almost like long eyelashes. They're interlocking eyelashes, which increases the surface area and so that they can trap large insects. Obviously, there's no point in them trapping little ants as they walk through. It's almost like having a snack or a couple of crisps. What they want is a decent meal. Now, once it's closed, there's a second movement. The trap will then just pressurise itself and literally cover the shape of the insect itself. So it seals it in, it becomes sealed in, and then the process of digestion starts. So what you have in the Venus flytrap is something that has almost like a nervous system, but nobody really understands how it worked. Even Darwin said that he thought that this was one of the most wonderful plants on Earth. And most of all, I think it's really exciting and confirms perhaps that God, the creator, has got almost a sense of humour. He's almost saying, just look at what I can do. I can do the things that you would expect me to do, but do things out of the ordinary too. And so he's presented us with this example, and there are many others too, of a carnivorous vegetable. And that's in itself is one of the reasons why I have no doubt that God created the heaven and the earth and that anything that he says is definitely worth listening to.
Well, I'm very interested in in the historical side of the Bible because I taught history for 17 years and uh, ever since have kept up a lively interest in, in the Bible and history. One of the things people don't realise is that the Bible is a remarkable historical document. And a particular example is uh, Jesus Christ, Jesus of Nazareth. Most people don't realise that apart from the four Gospels, there are about another 19 non-Christian sources which talk about Jesus to some degree. Two particular ones worth noticing are the Jewish historian Josephus, uh, who was generally in favour of Jesus, although not a disciple, but also the Roman historian Tacitus, who was virulently against the Christians and condemned them, but both make reference to Jesus Christ. So to be very sure that Jesus existed and that we can have confidence in what the Bible says. Now, one of the interesting things in relation to that is there's actually more evidence for the existence of Jesus of Nazareth than there is for the existence of Alexander the Great. Although nobody would question whether Alexander the Great exists as a historical figure. I want to talk about Alexander the Great because he's an interesting character in history, uh, but also the Bible has something to say about him. He didn't reign for very long. He, he was uh, in power around 330 years before Christ. He only reigned for 13 years, yet in that time he managed to conquer a whole area right across from Macedonia and Greece where he began, across to the borders of India. Nobody in his time could believe how fast his armies moved. Now that's one of the things which is reflected in the Bible. The Bible talks about Alexander the Great in several places. First of all, if we think about the prophet Daniel. The prophet Daniel was a Jewish prophet who uh, lived in Babylon about 580 years before Christ. Now the first thing you'll notice is that's 250 years before the time of Alexander the Great. The prophet Daniel had lots of different visions given to him by God. He had a vision, and he saw in this vision two animals. The first one was a ram. And as he watched, it expanded its territory, and nobody could stop it. Until the vision went on, there came from the west a he-goat, but also coming extraordinarily fast. And the he-goat charged the ram. And in a short time, utterly destroyed it, trampled it underfoot. The record in Daniel chapter 8 doesn't make us guess as to what this means. It actually tells us a bit further on in the chapter. And it says that the ram was the kingdom of the Medes and the Persians. The he-goat, it says, was the king of Greece. Now what's so remarkable about this, remember 250 years before the time of Alexander the Great, is exactly fulfilled by Alexander the Great, coming from the west, from Greece, coming with extraordinary speed and to destroy their armies and their navy and to take over their territory. So this exactly fulfills what Daniel had said. What about the other prophecies? Well, when Alexander the Great came into the area near to Israel, he came to the great city of Tyre. Tyre was an extraordinary place the most powerful maritime city in the whole of the Mediterranean. It was also a very strong place. The Babylonians had tried uh, and failed to take the city. They managed to capture the bit of it which was on the land, but the strongest part was an island off the coast. So when Alexander came to this, he was heading for Egypt. Well, there's a lot of rubble left from the attack of the Babylonians. And so what he did was he got his soldiers collect up the rubble and dump it in the sea and build a causeway. In seven months he captured this city which had seemed impregnable. The remarkable thing is that if we go to the prophecy of Ezekiel, he had foretold this, having been shown this by God, uh, in exact detail. In chapters 25 to 27 there's a great deal about Tyre, a lot of interesting information. But the crucial bit is in chapter 26. It talks first of all about the attack by the Babylonians and then part way through it starts to talk about the Greeks. It talks about them taking the spoil of the city and the rubbish from the previous attack and dumping it in the sea. 
exactly as happened in Alexander's day. There are many reasons why we can rely on the Bible. But for me, one of the most interesting things is the aspects of the law of Moses that deal with medicine and science. Part of the fascination of the Bible for me is that here we have an ancient book, in fact, probably the oldest book extant, which contains scientific information that we've only understood in the last century or so, and some that we've only appreciated in the last few decades. We're all familiar with the concern in our hospitals regarding the spread of infections such as Clostridium difficile and MRSA, methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus. These disease-causing organisms are spread on unwashed hands, and so hospital managements are anxious to encourage frequent hand-washing by staff and visitors. This is not a modern idea, it's as old as the Bible itself. Let me read you a short extract from Leviticus, part of the Law of Moses written about three and a half thousand years ago. It's concerned with someone who is suffering from a form of gastroenteritis. Anyone the man with a discharge touches without rinsing his hands with water must wash his clothes and bathe with water and he will be unclean till evening. Here it's quite clear that the potential for the spread of disease is being checked by washing hands. It is remarkable that the ancient Israelites had a law that would prevent the spread of infectious diseases. The concept was rediscovered in the 1800s when a Hungarian obstetrician, Dr. Semmelweis, realized that childbed fever or puerperal fever was being spread from patient to patient by doctors on washed hands. He reduced the mortality among mothers from one in four, that is 25%, to less than 1%. If only doctors had read their Bibles, the lives of countless young women would have been saved. The Law of Moses included the important concept of quarantine to prevent the spread of diseases. It had provision for the disposal of human waste that prevented the contamination of drinking water something that causes suffering and death from waterborne diseases such as enteritis, typhoid and cholera. They also had laws relating to slum clearance, ensuring that houses were fit for habitation, something we might think was a post-war development. We now recognize that the ancient Jewish dietary laws, for example those that banned pig meat products and shellfish, are based on sound scientific principles that, when ignored, can result in severe and sometimes fatal food poisoning. We now realize that too much of the wrong sort of fat in our diets can lead to heart disease and, as some doctors think, bowel cancer. The Law of Moses forbids the eating of any animal fat. In the last couple of decades, we've come to understand why the Law of Moses allowed that a contaminated wooden article could be washed but a contaminated pot vessel must be smashed. It's evident that a porous clay pot would be impossible to clean since bacteria could remain in the pores after it had been washed. But wood is also porous. Why was it acceptable to wash it? We now know that wood exudes a natural antibacterial substance and so is intrinsically hygienic. Studying the Bible has taught me, first of all, that it's obvious that the Bible is a book that was way, way ahead of its time. The laws of the surrounding contemporary nations simply don't compare with those to be found in the Bible. Not only did the law of Moses ensure a far better quality of life for those who kept it, but it also had a spiritual dimension, pointing forwards to something much greater. In the New Testament, we have the fulfillment of ancient promises that offer an endless life. Now, if the Bible was so remarkably scientifically right three and a half thousand years ago, surely we can depend on it to be right in guiding us in the present and for our futures.
I believe the Bible because it gives me a hope of eternal life. But having worked in the archaeology of Jerusalem and the land of Israel, I've also seen the accuracy of that historical record. It's amazing to see how accurately the cities are described in the Bible. And you can go there today, visit those biblical sites with the Bible in your hand, and you'll be convinced of the truth of the Bible. For 20 years, I've lived in the land of Israel. Most of the time, however, I worked in Jerusalem as an archaeological architect on all of the major excavations that took place there. And it gave me a complete picture of the city, of not only the Temple Mount, but to the south of it was the city of David, with the Siloam pool. In John chapter 9 we read that Jesus healed the man that was born blind. He spat on the ground, made a bit of paste with the, with the mud, and put it on the man's eyes, and he said to him, go and wash in the pool of Siloam. Well, you can still go to the Siloam pool today. The water is still streaming there, coming from the Gion Spring and running through Hezekiah's tunnel. And you can see the same water that was used by the blind men to wash in. Most visitors, when they come to Jerusalem for the first time, go to the top of the Mount of Olives. And the whole city is spread out before you. Rising above the Kidon Valley is the Temple Mount. And your mind goes back to that time when Jesus was there with his disciples. They pointed out to him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus prophesied that not one stone shall be left upon another. And that is true. Not one stone is left standing upon each other on the Temple Mount itself. They're all thrown down by the Romans. And you can still see them lying down on the street below the Western Wall. You can climb over those stones and touch them. But you must realize that you're touching the fulfillment of a prophecy that came to pass. We can go further back in the history of Jerusalem. When the exiles came back from Babylon, they first built a temple and an altar under Joshua and Zerubbabel. But later Nehemiah came and he built up the walls of Jerusalem. A very accurate plan has been described in the third chapter of the book of Nehemiah. But you can go to the city of David today and see a stretch of wall that was built by Nehemiah and his people. And there you can touch history and feel that the Bible is true indeed. In the Jewish quarter excavations, a massive Israelite tower was excavated, which I was able to identify later on as the middle gate, which is mentioned in Jeremiah chapter 39. But during the excavations, a most interesting find was made because on the outside, on a four inch thick layer of soot and, and burned stones, four arrowheads were found. Three were made of iron and one of bronze. The iron ones belonged to the Israelite army and the bronze one to the Babylonian army. It's a very telling testimony of that battle that took place and the destruction of Jerusalem. Abraham was called by God to take his son, his only son Isaac, and bring him there for an offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell you of. There was Mount Moriah, which is buried under the Temple Mount, although the top can still be seen inside the Dome of the Rock. Abraham didn't have to sacrifice his son Isaac, but God sacrificed his own son. It says in John chapter 3, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. The Bible is both a history book, a very accurate one for that, but it's also a book of hope to give us everlasting life. And that is why I believe and love the Bible. Music